Grand Theft Auto has left a mark on the pop culture landscape that few franchises have done before or since. To mark the 20th anniversary of GTA 3 and the announcement of GTA Trilogy The Definitive Edition, let's take a look at the history of Grand Theft Auto. In the early 90s, DMA Design, a Scottish developer known best for the cutesy but slightly sadistic Lemmings series, was experimenting with a top-down game of cops and robbers, known then as Race and Chase. The four-and-a-half-year development wasn't exactly easy. Only one person on the team had ever actually shipped a game before, and the team butted heads constantly over direction and scale. As most games in development do, it evolved. They realized it wasn't fun playing as the police, so that was dropped. A horror theme which would have the players running over zombies even emerged at one point. The team's wish to create a living, breathing city caused headaches and constantly needed to be tweaked and scaled back. A bug led to the police cars becoming really aggressive, which turned out to be incredibly fun, so the game was tweaked so that the police were really out to get you, rather than just try and pull you over. The name was changed partly because there were matchbox sets called Race and Chase, and partly to reflect the game's new criminal direction. Despite DMA design feeling like they were really onto something, publisher BMG Interactive kept wanting to cancel the game, even up to three months out from completion. Sam and Dan Hauser, brothers who worked at BMG and championed the game early on, helped to get it out the door. The game, titled Grand Theft Auto, was finally released in 1997 on PC, with a PlayStation version following a few months later. Even back then, the game contained a lot of the core DNA that GTA would be known for. You play as a rookie criminal looking to improve your reputation by taking on various jobs in three different fictional cities – San Andreas, Vice City, and Liberty City. The jobs are straightforward – ferry passengers, take out gang rivals, be a getaway driver. You are free to choose how and when to do them, but you'd only complete each level by reaching a set target amount of chaos. Cause too much bother though, and your wanted level increased and the cops were on your ass. You could respray your car to lose them for a while, but the more chaos you created, the tougher the response would end up being. Speaking of response, the original GTA certainly had a big one. In the UK, its PR was handled by the now-disgraced publicist Max Clifford, who deliberately courted controversy for attention by stirring up a public outcry with carefully placed newspaper articles that all but guaranteed that politicians would get involved. This led to discussions in the UK Parliament about banning the game before it even launched. Some countries, such as Brazil, did ban GTA for its violent content. Reviews of the game were mixed. Most critics weren't impressed by the graphics, but admitted that it was a huge amount of fun, and gave enormous praise for its sound work. In particular, the radio stations that would play whenever you got in and out of vehicles. It sold a million copies in its first year, and DMA knew they were onto something. In 1998, GTA's original publisher, BMG Interactive, was shut down by its parent company, and Take-Two Interactive swooped in to buy up its assets, including the rights to Grand Theft Auto and some key personnel such as the Hauser brothers. Rockstar Games was formed that year. More Grand Theft Auto was on the way, but it wasn't a fully-fledged sequel. Instead, GTA London 1969 was an expansion pack developed by Rockstar Canada in a basement under a fruit shop. The team described making the game as more like a ROM hack than building anything from scratch. In fact, the hardest part was switching the driver's side and changing the traffic logic so cars would drive on the other side of the road. Understandably, as the team was made up of mostly Canadians, they had to do a lot of research on British culture to get the lingo right. The team watched a lot of British movies like The Italian Job and read things like Viz magazine. By the way, Viz is an extremely different publication to the American Viz, just FYI. As a result, London 1969 was filled to the brim with Britishisms and references like Big Ben sound effects, character names that were a nod to beloved British celebrities, and crucial text was replaced with something distinctly more British. 
Listen, right, we're looking for a lad who can do his stuff. I've heard you're a bit tasty. No messing around or you get a slap. A second expansion pack, Grand Theft Auto London 1961, was released a few months later. It was free and only available on PC. It was set eight years before the previous expansion and featured the same characters, but new vehicles, missions and a new multiplayer map based on the northern city of Manchester. Nineteen ninety nine was a packed year for GTA, with developer DMA Design and publisher Rockstar releasing Grand Theft Auto Two in October of that year. Set in Anywhere City, USA, GTA Two had a sort of retro futuristic vibe to it, and the game experimented and built on what the developers had created with the original GTA. For example, you could now spend points to save your game and undertake jobs from different syndicates. Doing so would build your rep with one group, allowing you to take on different jobs with them, but sour your relationship with the others. The game doesn't feature any cutscenes to tell its story, and its intro was spliced together from GTA Two The Movie, a short film written by Dan Hauser. It features the Bill and EastEnders actor Scott Maslin as a criminal on the run from the police and an assassin in New York, even getting his car sprayed to evade detection, just like in the game. Looking back on it though, it's a very 1999 piece of filmmaking. GTA 2 had pretty mixed reviews and didn't like the world on fire as much as the first game did. In his review for GameSpot, Jeff Gerstmann said that occasionally it felt like a glorified mission pack for the first game, and mentioned that its multiplayer was pretty sluggish, even over a LAN connection. But he did praise its music. It was clear that the 2D era of GTA was on the out, and with the shiny 3D graphics dominating the video game industry at the time thanks to the PlayStation, something had to change. And change it did. Grand Theft Auto 3 was the first game in the series to be 3D, and despite a lukewarm reception at that year's E3, it was a huge success, going on to change open world games as we know them. For Rockstar and DMA, it was a whole new challenge. Not only were they working to populate and bring a 3D world to life, but they had to balance non-linear and story-driven gameplay so that players felt like they had stuff to do but also the freedom to do whatever they wanted. With so many plates to spin, a decision was made during development to keep the protagonist silent. In fact, we didn't actually even know his name until San Andreas came out. After being betrayed by his girlfriend, Claude manages to escape imprisonment and gets tied up with the Mafia in Liberty City as they knock heads with the Triads, Yakuza and Cartel. Its voice cast also included some huge names like Michael Madsen. I want you to destroy their laundry vans and mangle any triad gimp that gets in your way. And Kyle MacLachlan. My property will be waiting for you at the customs hangar in the aircraft fuselage. And Soprano stars Frank Vincent and Joe Pantoliano. Remember, no one messes with my girls. Gameplay-wise, it was a whole new world. The impact of making the game 3D cannot be understated. Liberty City was unlike anything anyone had ever really seen or played in before. It teemed with life, as well as opportunities for mischief. The game was actually delayed due to the 9-11 attacks in New York. According to author Harold Greenberg, the houses considered cancelling it altogether, with Sam saying to his brother Dan, this beautiful city has been attacked and now we're making a violent crime drama set in a city that's not unlike New York City. My god, I'm terrorized where I live, and on top of that, we've got this f***ing crazy game that is not exactly where people's heads are at right now. The game ended up being delayed for three weeks as Rockstar removed references and gameplay that would be inappropriate in a post-9-11 world. The biggest change was the cover art, but the color scheme of the police cars was changed to look less like the NYPD. GTA 3 was a behemoth, and Rockstar was unstoppable. It was lauded by critics and sits at a 97% on Metacritic. It was the highest selling game in the States in 2001, despite launching in late October, and according to 2008 Take-Two Financials, it sold 14.5 million units in seven years. But it wasn't without its controversies. Along with outrage at its violence, there was a huge outcry when it was discovered that players could hire and then kill a prostitute to get their money back. 
The game was banned and recalled in Australia, only being re-released when the sexual content was cut. Rockstar, Take-Two, Sony and Walmart were sued after two teens shot two people, claiming that they were inspired by playing a GTA. Vice City started life as a mission pack for GTA 3, but after realizing that they were coming up with too many ideas for a simple expansion pack, Rockstar decided to make a completely new game. The team settled on 80s Miami, partly because of Sam Hauser's love of Miami Vice, but also because it was a setting they had previously wanted to use in a mission pack for the original GTA. Sam Hauser said that 80s Miami was the, quote, grooviest era of crime because it didn't really feel like crime. Rockstar and the newly bought DMA design, which was later renamed Rockstar North, wanted to change up the core concept of the game. Instead of a revenge plotline, they wanted to focus on building a criminal empire. You could become a kingpin by buying assets like taxi companies and strip clubs, and then rake in the rewards once you'd completed their associated missions. After a silent protagonist in GTA 3, Vice City's Tommy Vassetti was anything but, being voiced by Goodfellas star Ray Liotta. That there are more criminals in this town than in prison. In fact, the whole game was packed full of stars, including Luis Guzman. What do you think you're doing? Gary Busey. Hey, Tommy! How you doing? This bitch is hot! Danny Trejo. You think you'll play stupid with me? And British icon Danny Dyer. <laughs> Get another drink, Rob. While the performances were well received, Rockstar actually started pairing back on using huge names as protagonists, with Sam Hauser revealing later that he was questioning whether he was playing as Tommy or playing as Ray Liotta. Vice City was a hit. At the time, it was the fastest selling game in history and the biggest game of 2002. It received universal critical acclaim, but just like GTA 3 before it, it had its fair share of controversies. Many advocacy groups lobbied for it to be banned, politicians threatened to sue Take-Two Interactive, and Jack Thompson, remember him, kept filing suits against Sony and Take-Two, claiming a number of murders committed by young men were inspired by GTA. The records set by Vice City were smashed by San Andreas, which became the highest selling PlayStation 2 game of all time. San Andreas takes place in 1992 in a fictionalized version of California. Former gang member CJ returns home after his mother's death and is framed for the murder of a cop. He reconnects with old friends and falls back into the gangster lifestyle. Oh shit, here we go again. San Andreas toyed with more RPG elements, making CJ really customizable. You could change his outfit, hairstyle, tattoos, and more. CJ needed to eat well and exercise to stay healthy. Doing so would impact physical attributes and how other characters would respond to him. Certain skills would increase through repeated use, such as driving, shooting, and running. You could also swim and climb. It was a whole new world. To earn cash, there were a multitude of mini-games, including gambling and you could take over enemy gang turf using gang members as backup. CJ could have girlfriends, and that landed Rockstar in some hot water, or should I say, hot coffee. During development, a sex minigame was in San Andreas, but was removed before the game released. Someone on the internet discovered it by combing through the game files and released a mod that allowed players to enable it. This caused something of a storm, leading the ESRB to reclassify San Andreas as an adults-only game, therefore restricting where it could be sold. It became a hot-button political topic too. The FTC launched an investigation and Hillary Clinton got involved, leading to her face being included in GTA 4 on the Statue of Liberty. The game was patched by Rockstar and the new version without the sex minigame was able to be sold at its original rating. Rockstar released the handheld Grand Theft Auto Advance on the same day as San Andreas. Advance acted as a prequel to GTA 3, but reverted to the top-down 2D stylings of the original games. While you meet characters like 8-Ball from GTA 3 throughout the course of the story, the protagonist Mike was pretty forgetful, and the game was ultimately overshadowed by the success of San Andreas.
One prequel to GTA 3 clearly wasn't enough and Rockstar released another in 2005, this time for the PSP. Liberty City Stories follows GTA 3's Tony Cipriani after his return from exile due to killing a member of the Mafia. The game featured a wireless multiplayer mode as well as some gameplay mechanics from San Andreas like gang wars and character outfits. Liberty City Stories ended up being the highest selling PSP game of all time, followed by Vice City Stories. This one acted as a prequel to Vice City, where you play as Vic Vance, Vic Vance reporting for duty, sir. a minor character who dies in the opening of Vice City. The biggest gameplay change was the addition of Empire Building. Borrowing ideas from Vice City and San Andreas, you could purchase or take over enemy sites and build businesses on them to generate revenue. Rival gangs will attack and you need to protect and maintain your businesses. Fail to do so and they get put up for sale. At a 2006 Microsoft press conference, then Xbox boss Peter Moore rolled up his sleeve to reveal a fake tattoo that served to announce GTA 4, and the promise that it would launch on the 360 on the same day as PC and PlayStation 3. Alongside that, he revealed that exclusive episodic content would be available on Xbox Live. For this next generation GTA, Rockstar went all out, bringing together teams from New York, Edinburgh, Lincoln and San Diego to work on the project. The team wanted the world to be the most important element of the game, with writer Dan Hauser calling Liberty City GTA 4's biggest character. It wasn't the biggest map that Rockstar had made, but it was the densest. The team wanted Liberty City to feel like a living, breathing world, with more of a focus on realism than they'd done before. Extensive research was undertaken in New York, with Rockstar opting not to recreate the city faithfully, but to capture its key characteristics. The art style was less cartoony, and using state-of-the-art performance capture tech made the characters feel more lifelike. Protagonist Nico was able to keep up with friends via his mobile phone, and there were countless fake in-game brands, TV shows, and radio stations that grounded you in a more realistic world. Nico, it's Roman. Let's go bowling. Early trailers for the game made it look like GTA had lost that edgy cartoon humor and was going in a new, more serious direction. Which it did and didn't. It was a little more serious, yes, but GTA 4 was still full of wacky, irreverent characters and was the sandbox playground we all expected. Unlike other GTA games that really wore their cinematic influences proudly, GTA 4 was consciously trying not to be so referential, instead trying to focus on telling a new story about Eastern European war veteran Nico Bellic moving to Liberty City to live the American dream. Upon arriving, it's clear that the tales told to him by his cousin Roman were a little tall. Where's Barbara with big titties and Stephanie who sucks like a vacuum? What are you talking about? And Nico gets involved in the criminal life that he was hoping to leave behind. After feeling that San Andreas was a little linear, Dan Hauser pushed to implement player choice into some of the GTA 4 missions, which involved sparing or killing certain characters. Multiplayer was designed as an extension of single player, and you could access it via Nico's mobile phone. GTA 4 was also the first game to utilize the Rockstar Games Social Club, an online social network that allows players to compare statistics, fight for leaderboard spaces, as well as upload their own pictures and videos. This might surprise you, but GTA 4 was an enormous success. Critically, it got 10s across the board and holds a 98 on Metacritic, making it the third highest rated game of all time. It was also the fastest selling entertainment product at the time, making $500 million in its first week. This record would then be broken by its sequel, but before we get there, it's time to talk about some more spin-offs and expansions. The Lost and Damned was the first expansion for GTA 4, and was one of the two hinted at by Peter Mort back in 2006. Rockstar said that it had built this huge world for GTA 4, but it was limiting to only set one story in it. So Lost and Damned took place at the same time as GTA 4 and its other expansion, The Ballad of Gay Tony. It featured a lot of familiar faces like Nico, but the game was played from the perspective of Johnny, acting president of the Lost Motorcycle Club. As a result, the game was more focused on brotherhood, rather than climbing the criminal ladder from the very bottom. 
Johnny would later make an appearance in GTA 5, but it didn't exactly end well for him. Thank you! Chinatown was released for the Nintendo DS and the PSP in 2009, and it followed Huang Li, a member of the Triads, as he fights to recover his dead father's stolen sword. As it was released on the DS, Rockstar used a lot of interaction via the touchscreen. The game wasn't quite top-down, utilizing more of a floating, isometric camera, and its graphics looked more cartoony and cel-shaded. While the buying and selling of drugs in the game was deemed controversial, it's a GTA game, of course there had to be some controversy somewhere. It was very highly praised upon release. Critics were amazed with how Rockstar managed to squeeze Liberty City onto the DS, and GameSpot's review said that, This isn't just a DS version of GTA, this is a fantastic game that advances the series. Back to those downloadable expansions for GTA 4, and The Ballad of Gay Tony capped off a busy year for GTA releases. You play as Luis Lopez, in deep debt and weighing up whether or not to sell out his partner Tony before Tony sells him out. Gay Tony and The Lost and Damned were later released as a standalone double pack that you could play without needing the base game. Which brings us to GTA 5. Development began at Rockstar North shortly after the release of GTA 4, and over time, the GTA 5 team worldwide grew to over a thousand developers. Drawing on the three protagonists from GTA 4 and its expansions, and with a wish to innovate and push themselves, Rockstar opted for not one, but three protagonists that you can switch between. You couldn't switch if you were on a mission, but if you were in free roam, Trevor, Michael, or Franklin were just a button press away. The camera would automatically zoom out and pan to your chosen character, in the middle of doing whatever it is they're doing, to give a sense that the world carried on while you weren't around. The three played off each other wonderfully. The three And the different lives they led all felt fleshed out, and had their own stories and characters that you wanted to follow. The three have an interconnected story and frequently group up with the eventual goal of stealing a whole lot of money. Heists were inspired by the reception to the GTA 4 mission Three Leaf Clover, and were the key points in the game, tricky jobs that the characters had to meticulously plan to efficiently pull off. If doing the main story wasn't for you, there were a multitude of minigames to choose from, or you could use the game as a playbox to make some yourself. As with GTA 4, the team did a huge amount of research to create Los Santos and the surrounding area in 5. The map was huge and stuffed with things to do. With the ability to swap characters easily, as well as a multitude of land and air vehicles, getting around was not only easy, but intoxicating. Los Santos was full of wacky characters, side missions, as well as secrets, like a certain Mount Chiliad mystery. It was also the first game in the series to actually have its own score, on top of the radio stations that featured licensed music. It was the biggest GTA to date, and in terms of gameplay, an evolution and triumph for the series. It was the most hotly anticipated game of the year, and upon release, received glowing scores. It brought in $1 billion in just three days, making it the biggest entertainment launch of all time. It's also the second best-selling game of all time, just after Minecraft, and it smashed all records held by GTA 4. It was re-released a year later for Xbox One and PlayStation 4 consoles with improved weather effects and increased draw distance, as well as a new first-person mode. A PC version followed in 2015, and it's set to be released again on PS5 and Xbox Series X and S in 2022. While the world waits for another mainline GTA game, Rockstar has been updating its wildly popular Grand Theft Auto Online, the multiplayer that was released a couple of weeks after GTA 5. After a slightly rocky launch, which was patched pretty quickly, it's become the main vehicle for GTA updates, with meaty free content packs every year or so. Online was conceived as a continually evolving separate experience, and allows you to create a character and build your own empire, either alone or with a crew of friends. Every big update adds new modes, cosmetics, missions, and even characters from previous games, like Tony from Ballad of Gay Tony. Heists, the beloved centerpiece of GTA 5, were a huge addition that came to online in 2015. Online has really taken on a world of its own, 
people make their own game modes and even roleplay on its servers. While everyone is champing at the bit for GTA 6, GTA Online is still wildly popular. It frequently appears in the top played games on Twitch and Steam. It's due to be released as a standalone experience in 2022 on PS5 and on Xbox Series X and S. The British genius behind the most lucrative video game ever. This is beyond what film can do. Hot off the heels of the historic launch of GTA 4, you couldn't escape Rockstar Games, and the BBC decided to make a docudrama about Sam Hauser and Jack Thompson's legal battle following the release of Vice City, as well as the hot coffee fallout. It had a pretty star-studded cast, including Harry Potter himself, Daniel Radcliffe as Sam Hauser, and Aliens star Bill Paxton as Jack Thompson. In surely a bad sign for everyone at the Beeb, Take-Two Interactive filed suit against the BBC for trademark infringement before the game changes even aired, saying that they tried to resolve the matter with the BBC multiple times with no success. The movie didn't exactly go down well with fans either. It was full of weird continuity errors like images from GTA 4 and 5 being visible in the background of shots, despite the movie being set between 2002 and 2006. There's also a scene where they're watching a hot coffee video on YouTube, despite YouTube not existing yet. And there was some very questionable understanding of how games are actually made. After its launch, Rockstar tweeted this absolute all-timer. Was Basil Brush busy? What exactly is this random, made-up bollocks? Funnily enough, it's pretty impossible to track the film down these days. In October 2021, Rockstar announced that to celebrate the 20th anniversary of GTA 3, it would bring 3, San Andreas, and Vice City to current generation platforms, including Nintendo Switch and later mobile, offering graphical and modern gameplay enhancements. So there you have it, the history of one of the most venerated video game series of all time. For more on GTA, keep your eyes peeled to GameSpot because this powerhouse ain't slowing down anytime soon and we'll have all the latest. For more deep dives into your favorite games, make sure to like this video and subscribe to GameSpot. I'm on Twitter at LucyJamesGames, and I'll catch you next time.